Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation as part of the Industry Insight webinar series. The topic this time is Cybersecurity 2017. It's a scary world out there. And speaking today will be Thomas Shesso. Thomas is Vice President of Technology Infrastructure at Abacus Data Systems. He has a dynamic 17-year technology career marked by demonstrated ability to create solid business solutions, determine product needs, build teams, and achieve cross-functional business objectives. He is a results-driven executive who builds and secures enterprise-level technologies through growth initiatives and is a valued member of leadership teams. The Industry Insight webinar series is hosted by the ABA Legal Technology Resource Center. To stay updated on upcoming webinars or view previous videos, visit ambar.org slash industry insight. You can also stay updated on legal technology news through our blog, lawtechnologytoday.org. The presentation today will be followed by a Q&A. Please enter all your questions into the question box in the webinar panel on the right side of your screen. All questions will be addressed at the end of this presentation. We are also recording this webinar, and we will be sending the video in a follow-up email in a few days. We'll also post the video on our blog, which again is lawtechnologytoday.org. Thank you all for joining us today, and we'll now begin the webinar. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, good after, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Thomas Shesso, VP of Technology Infrastructure here at Abacus Next. Um, I want to start off talking a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, we've been a software company for about 30 years, a um, little over 250,000 clients. Um, and what we've learned from that experience is uh, when listening to our clients is that developing a practice management suite um, has been great for us, but our clients needed more. Um, we've incorporated the wealth of technology and experience into an unprecedented suite of <clears throat> integrated technology solutions designed to enable small, medium, and large firms to in all practice areas and jurisdictions of law and leverage from the four pillars of legal technology success, technology readiness, practice management platforms, continued improvement, and management support. And really, in a nutshell, what does that mean? Um, we've looked, as I stated before, we've looked at our customer base, um, we've understood the needs and the concerns, and we've developed solutions around those. Um, a little bit about me, again, a 17-year technology career marked by demonstrating the ability to create solid business solutions, determine product needs, teams, and achieve cross-functional business objectives. Um, I'm a results-driven executive, a valued member of our, our leadership teams, and contribute to a broad-based perspective to create progr programmatic strategies and implement plans to design maximum return. Um, the agenda for today is we're going to talk about types of threats that we're seeing in 2017. Um, we're going to talk about recent examples that have come out. We're also going to talk about mitigation efforts for local networks, web servers, and email servers. We're going to talk about some tips to keep you safe, and then obviously at the end we'll have a Q&A. Jumping right into it. Um, ransomware and extortion will increase. Um, we've all been aware of ransomware. It came out in 2013. Um, better known as crypto defense, crypto wall, crypto locker, etc. The effects of this um, have been tremendous. We've seen where a customer has become infected, and not only is the local machine um, encrypted, but also network resources are encrypted. The delivery of the virus or the infection is usually via email. More times than not, we've seen this infection come through a link to a public Dropbox, box.com, whatever it might be, and the end user executes thinking that the infection has come from someone they know and or from someone that they don't know. And they click on the link because it says to, they do so, and then the virus or the malware infection will start to attack. The only way outside of this, the ways around that, is to pay the ransom. And that's why we've seen the increase. Um, ransomware is one of the most widespread and damaging threats that the internet faces today. Some of the infamous crypto locker first appeared, as I stated, in 2013, and we've seen new eras of this life encrypting ransomware variants delivered through spam messaging, exploit kits, and extorting money from home users and businesses alike. IoT hacks will increase. Uh, as technology advances, there are more devices connected to the internet today than ever anticipated. Um, we've exhausted an IPv4 space, we have now moved on to an IPv6 space. And what does that mean? That means, again, we have more devices connected, and those devices, when we talk about Internet of Things, are, some examples are, the smart devices we have at home, the Nest, um, our watches, our phones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I can go on the list. Again, there are more and more devices that are connected to the Internet today that is bleeding out data. And I don't want to say that it's spewing, I want to tell you that it's bleeding out data. 
that data that those devices are putting out, um, thousands and thousands of terabytes of data, right? Um, but a good example of an attack with an IoT device is a DIN DNS that we experienced last year. Um, botnets were installed upon unsecured and really unthought of devices. If it's the home um, Nest device or if it's a camera or whatever the device might be, these bots were installed and when the attack happened, the attack, the bots is what attacked the DIN DNS servers. What does that mean to the internet as a whole? Then DNS is a very large public DNS company. They host DNS servers for multiple businesses in multiple domains. Um, when that attack happened, we saw companies go down or their presence on the internet go down. And that's what that attack happened. That's a clear example of a DDoS attack and we'll get into the details of how those work in a couple other slides. Um, but again, we are seeing that IoT hacks are increasing. We are seeing that more devices and people aren't taking those devices seriously. They have access to the internet they are a computer in some function and can have virus and infections. So recommendations, I always like to give these at the end of, as we're talking about this, um, make sure that you're keeping those devices up to date from the manufacturer. Um, another uh, piece of this is the internal threats. The increase of targeting of social media and personnel email bypass many network defenses like email scans and URL filters. The most dangerous aspect is how attackers manipulate victims offer or threats that they would not want to present like to an employer, like employment offers or illicit content. And I have a clear example. I had this happen to me last night. I was driving home and I went to go check my voicemail. There was a message from quote unquote the IRS that I was in legal trouble and that I needed to call this phone number. I immediately went to search the, the phone number to understand what it was and it was a, a social engineering attack. Here we are or here I am driving home, I have a voicemail that's telling me that I'm in legal trouble with the IRS, I do a search on the internet, and I find out that it's an IRS scam. It's a perfect example of a, of a threat coming from an external source. Um, in past experience when working as a consultant, I was working with a broker dealer here based in San Diego, and we had a social engineering attack as well. We had uh, an email address that was created by an attacker, it had a single letter that was different than the originator's email, and the request came through as the um, customer would have requested for money to be transferred. Unfortunately, the money was transferred to an account that was not the customer's, and that broker-dealer had transferred out about $900,000 worth of data, or $900,000, um, to accounts that then transferred on to accounts that then transferred on to accounts. We worked closely with the FBI and were able to uncover how this happened, we were not able to stop the attack or, or get the money back, really. Um, it's an unfortunate, but these are the things that happen uh, when we start to talk about internal threats. Um, as I mentioned in my previous slide, the DDoS attack at DEN, you know, we need to take the denial, uh, denial of service attacks serious. Um, it will crash the internet again. That's not a question about it. And what we mean by crash the internet, it's not that it's taking down the servers. It's preventing access to the servers that are hosting the domains. Um, so what is a denial of service attack? For those that don't know, right? a denial of service attack is typically accomplished by flooding the targeted machine or resource with superfluous requests in an attempt to overload the system and prevent some of the legitimate requests from being fulfilled. A DOS attack is an analogous to a group of people crowding the entire door or, gate of a sh or of a shop and business and not letting legitimate parties enter the shop or business disrupting normal operations. Now I'm reading that right off the slide, but really what it is, is it's a flood of the attack through the door. So if you have a door um, and you're trying to you know, stick 100 people through it, obviously it's going to happen single file. That's what the attack looks like. Um, again, referencing the DEN attack that ha happened last year in October, um, it was a denial of service attack using IoT devices that took down on two different occasions on the same day up to four hours of outages. Again, the businesses that were using those, uh, those services from DEN, their presence on the internet was taken down. It's not that the businesses were shut down, but their presence on the internet was taken down. And in a today's world, how do we find information? Our first thought is to search. Our first thought is to go try and find somebody's website, whatever the case might be. Those businesses no longer had a presence during those times. Um, this one just came out. The U.S. law firm uh, has been hacked by the Chinese nationals for $4 million in insider trading profits. Um, we, we understand how this happened now. Uh, server, you know, two web servers for each of the uh, firms were hacked. Um, the attackers watched uh, 
mergers and acquisitions information going across. We're able to understand where mergers and acquisitions were going to take place, and we're able to do insider trading based on those. Um, they profited for, they're saying they profited $4 million in insider trading. Uh, you know, I can't stress enough, you know, when we're looking at the internet, when we're talking about things, it is a dirty world out there, right? It's a scary world. There are, you know, people on the internet, there are attackers on the internet at all times trying to be uh, malicious and steal information. Uh, this is a good example, especially in the case that we're speaking on here, of, of it happening to, to, a, to large firms. Um, but small firms are just as at risk. There's just as much information in a small firm as there in a large firm that, that it can be compromised and used against. Business security spending will increase. Um, this is our hope, right? This is our hope in moving forward. In 2017, security conversations will continue to intensify around not only securing the data and network, but physical security as well. Think about the building, the people, and the assets. And really what we're talking about here is not just not just the security of it all, but actually investing in that security. Not just the, the cameras or the network security or the badge system when people enter the building or whatever the case might be. We're talking about businesses investing in the security and not letting security be an afterthought, but truly be on the forefront of what you're thinking about in your day-to-day -day when running that business. And that leads right into my next slide. Security note will no longer be an afterthought. Um, in 2017, it will be a critical year for security. Starting with how it's built into technology, DevOps and security will change the way they work together as they realize they need to integrate with each other in order to survive. And what's the takeaway from that? I think I said it previous. We need to have security always on the forefront. We need to be thinking about ways to secure the environments that we're in. We can talk about physical security. We can talk about network security. We can talk about firewalls. We can talk about two-factor. We can talk about web servers. There's lots of it out there, right? But really what we need to be thinking about is we need to invest in the securing of the environments that we're a part of. So some mitigation efforts. I think it's important that if we talk about cybersecurity, uh, we talk about threats, we talk about hacks, we have some examples of, is how do we mitigate those efforts? Um, here at Abacus, we have adopted for our Abacus private cloud a technology called Duo, which is a two-factor authentication. There are many two-factor authentication options out there. We chose Duo simply for the fact that it is not a text message and or a token when it came to the um, issuing of the two-factor. It is a push notification using a secure application provided by Duo to our devices when logging into our cloud. Um, we, we use that, we use that um, for ourselves as well as offer it as a service for our customers. Um, for those that don't know what two-factor authentication is, it is when you're credentialing in with a username and password, you get another factor of authentication. Um, uh, as I stated before, there's multiple options out there. We chose Duo as our two-factor authentication because it uses a push notification. It is not a text message, which means it cannot be intercepted. And most online systems, including QuickBooks, Dropbox, and most practice management systems today are offering the two-factor authentication. Um, if you have a chance, please review Duo's site. Um, it, it is on the screen, duo.com. They, they integrate with so much. If it's an RDP session, if it's a web uh, logging into a website, there are so many different ways that you can in incorporate Duo into your day-to-day -day lives. Securing a local area network uh, with, with NGFs is what we like to call those, the next generation firewalls. And, and we've had firewalls for years, right? What is the NGF? Really, when we think about the next generation firewall, we think about a few things, right? One, IPS and IDS. Those are going to be the intrusion prevention systems and intrusion detection systems baked into the firewall. So not a separate appliance, not a separate service, but something that is baked into the firewall in its initial offering. Um, obviously, having secure VPN access, SSL, initi SSL and or user initiated, whichever works for that business, but the ability to have secure VPN access is is eminent, right? We are all out in this workforce traveling, doing what we will, and we need the ability to connect back into our local network, but we need to ensure that it's secured. Um, Site-to-site -site VPNs, especially when multiple offices are involved, is obviously a better way to go about it than just um, having user-initiated VPNs. The site-to-site -site VPNs are hardware-to-hardware, firewall-to-firewall. Those allow for all traffic passing between the two offices and or the, between the two sites, if that's a data center in an office, whatever it might be, allows for all of that traffic to be encrypted. 
so that it cannot be sniffed, it cannot be checked um, from the wide open internet. Um, obviously a self-service portal for looking at quarantine items, VPN configurations, etc., is a part of those next generation firewalls. Um, and that just allows for uh, the user to, exactly what I said, you know, act with some self-servicing. Um, advanced threat protection, uh, you know, the ability for the firewall to identify an anomaly in traffic and or a threat in the traffic is key. It is key. If a firewall can, can find the threat and mitigate that threat, that threat never makes it to the endpoint, meaning the desktop, the laptop, the phone, et cetera. So because they are out there now, we always encourage our customers or when working with anybody um, to make sure that they're investing in next generation firewalls. Um, we, touched, we touched on two-factor authentication with Duo. Um, the next generation firewalls also have two-factor authentication, um, and that's really going to be for when issuing an SSL VPN into an environment, um, using an SSL client, whatever a case might be. Um, and those are going to be similar to what we used to see, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years ago with the RSA keys and tokens that change every 30 seconds. So those keys are changing every 30 seconds. Securing web servers. And the, and the reason I put this up as its own piece is because with the US law firm that, that were hacked here, you know, back in a I believe late last year, um, we want to talk about WAF, right? Web application firewalls. Protecting those web servers the way they need to be protected. We have clear examples, happened late last year, of two web servers in 2014 and 2015 being compromised. That data was used to generate $4 million worth of profit for individuals who compromised those. So web application firewalls protect the web servers and the applications alike. Server hardening with deep link per with d deep link protection from hardening, um, that's really looking at the core OS that's running for those web servers. So we're going to have a core operating system, and then we're going to have our web services on top of that. We need to harden the core operating system to ensure that it's patched, to ensure that any um, ex exploits that have been identified have been mitigated via the manufacturer, etc. cetera. Um, antivirus and scanning on file uploads, obviously that is in key. Um, we would anticipate that most users would have antivirus at the desktop. Right, or at their um, endpoint, whichever that is, if that's a desktop, a laptop, whatever the case might be. Um, but also, yes, if you have a web server that is accepting data from a customer or from a client, having the ability to scan that file before it is solidified and said, yes, it's available, is key. That way, you're ensuring that that crypto locker virus is not coming into your environment via a unknown source. Sometimes the client doesn't even know they're infected, so they move the file. They don't, they don't understand what's happened there. Um, so really, you know, going back to the, the main point, right, web application firewalls. They are available. Um, some have them baked into an NGF that we just spoke about before, and some are an add-on service that you can, be, can, you, can uh, participate in. Email protection. Can't stress it enough. We just can't stress this enough. Spam filters, antivirus filters at the edge, all of those are key elements to protecting the email, protecting your email. Um, Self-service quarantines we talk about, we spoke about those in those next generation firewalls. A part of the NGFs that, that Abacus utilizes is a spam and quarantine already baked into the solution. So our next generation firewalls that we have subscribed to have the spam and antivirus filtering already baked into them. And we get quarantine lists every day to let us know who has tried to submit in or email in a um, quarantine or a, an infected file and or message containing infection. Yes, there are false positive, but I will tell you the stricter is better. Right? Everybody wants just to whitelist and move forward and say, hey, I know who these people are or I know who this distribution list is from, etc. I, I would encourage you to always be mindful of where those messages are coming from, just looking at the header or looking at the, the email addresses in detail to ensure that it is the email address that you expect prior to executing anything within a message. Um, Outlook add-ins are, are, are great. If the uh, antivirus um, or the antivirus uh, company that you use today has an Outlook plugin so that you can mark something as spam or a message can be checked for a virus prior to opening, that is key. Um, so those Outlook plugins we've seen great success with um, internally as well as with some of our customers. So a few tips to keep you safe. I think the glaring one for me is Think before you act, right? Pause, take a moment, look at the attachment, understand who it's from. Is it something that you knew was coming and you were expecting? Is it the, uh, the sender, 
someone that you knew was you, you traded emails with before, etc. But really taking a moment, pausing and thinking before we act. If we're doing a Google search, if we get into the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth page, should we be clicking on all those links and trying to find out, you know, continuing on, or should we refine our search to try and be more specific to the use case that we're trying to use, right? So really, that. I can't stress it enough. We talk about it internally. We talk about it with our customers. Think before you act. Take a moment. Pause. 30 seconds isn't going to kill us. Um, really, and then second tip, businesses need to start creating a plan for an attack. What happens if you are attacked? What are you going to do? What is your mitigation plan? How are you going to understand what's happened, what was compromised, what's been removed from the environment, and now secure? How are you going to go through that? So having a mitigation plan or a plan of attack is key. Um, I, I think this goes without saying number three, but I'm going to say it anyways. Confirm that your computers and browsers are always up to date with the latest from the operating system manufacturer. I, I don't think we can say anything more than that, right? If, if you're a Windows shop, Windows updates. If you're a Mac OS shop, yes, we used to all hear that Macs no longer would not be infected with viruses. That is not true. That is not true. They can be infected. So keeping those, those um, devices up to date is key. Um, from an email perspective, if you're using Office 365 or if you're using Gmail, I included a link in here to check if your accounts have been compromised. Um, the beauty of Office 365 and Gmail alike is that they have these features baked into the solutions so that you can actually log in and check the last time that someone tried to access your account, where that account was tried to access from. Um, Gmail actually does a great job with sending a notification if access from a different IP address than something that it has known in the past. So those solutions are out there, so I would encourage everybody to, you know, if you're using Gmail and or Office 365 as an email solution, I would encourage you to take a peek, see when the last time your accounts were accessed or somebody tried to use your password um, or attempt to uh, test your password and or try to log in as you. And finally, when it comes to passwords, using a password management tool is key. Right. LastPass is what we utilize here internally. Uh, KeePass is another one that's available. Um, these are online, uh, online services that are free to an end user. So if, you know, to an end user, these services are free. They can be accessed anywhere from a web browser, uh, a, a mobile device, um, if, if we're in a paid account, et cetera. Um, but it's a secure place to store your passwords um, so that you don't have to remember them. More importantly, it allows for you to create cryptic passwords. So we're no longer seeing password one, two, three, or capital P at SSW0RD for passwords. We, those are known. If you're using them, people know about them. So these places allow for you to also generate passwords um, in a cryptic manner. Put cybersecurity on the agenda before it becomes the agenda. And I can't say that enough, right? Make it your agenda for 2017 before it becomes your agenda for 2017. Um, many people feel like it won't happen to them. Uh, many people feel like we're too small. Um, you know, we have security you know, already in mind. I, I would encourage everybody to have an agenda before it becomes your agenda. The impact of not recognizing and preempting cyber risk can be long term. They can be business shattering. They can be business closing. So ensuring that you have a plan, you have an agenda on how to react if you have been attacked and how to ensure that your mitigation plan is in place and protecting the assets within the environment.